Well, good morning, everyone. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad And for those who are watching us today. Uh, glad you could join us for the service this morning. This time, Patty will lead us forward with the announcements, and I will conclude with a couple of announcements. Good morning, everyone. Good morning out there. We welcome you this morning on the 12th Sunday after Pentecost. Are there any church announcements this morning? Annie? A council meeting Tuesday evening at 4.30 is still pending. There is coffee hour after church today, downstairs. Any other announcements? Well, Janet beat me to the one I was going to make about coffee hour. So there will be coffee hour, a lot of goodies down there. So probably something to take home as well. The other is this. Now, I know... Um, Obviously, we can't require people to wear masks, uh, but the Delta variant, variant is really beginning to uh, wreak havoc. So during the hymns and stuff, you know, I'm going to encourage people to wear masks. It's certainly social distance. Uh, Ron Mall tested positive. He's home right now uh, with the new variant. So uh, they will certainly, you will all be in our prayers. But uh, it's not a bad idea, you know, because a lot of people are getting sick that weren't sick before. So anyway, so just, uh, I would just welcome you to do that. I want to see your smiling faces, but, uh, and I'm going to sing through paper because you can hear my voice better because I know Sharon likes to sing along. So, and with cloth, I can sound kind of like, and I understand that. I understand that. So if there are no other announcements, I will turn it back over to Pat. Please stand for the call to worship. May the peace of God rest upon your busy lives so that you may be quieted into prayer. May the love of God flow through your worship words that they may be alive with opportunities for service. May the grace of God seek our, seek our your every need and may the restless gospel set our hearts afire. Amen and amen. Let's join in our opening prayer. We thank you, gracious God, that you hear us when we pray to you. Make us bold to trust you. Make us patient to wait on you. You open wide the door to your heart when you knock. Help us to respond by opening to you. Through the grace of Jesus Christ, amen. Our opening hymn this morning is Rejoice, Ye Pure in Heart.
Let's give thanks and sing. With all of these additions, I have to figure out what I'm taking off here, my mask or, the, uh, or this uh, microphone. Uh, would you please be seated? And I was thinking of rejoicing. Uh, I'm going to call out Sharon Wintland. Uh, she, she will probably scold me when I get home because she told me, she said, I like hearing you guys sing up here because she can sing along at home. So I wonder how many of you are singing, singing these hymns at home. And Sharon, sing it out we, so we can hear you. So my friends, we are loved. You hear me say that every Sunday. We're loved beyond measure. Now next Sunday, I'm going to be talking about the prodigal son. I'm going to, we're going to take a deep dive into that, you know, and that kind of love, because that really is a quality of loving the character of God. And all of those stories related to that, and more contemporary stories. But having said that, that, that reminds me, God is a God of grace. God is a God of mercy. That gives us the freedom, when we stumble and fall, to go to God with that. So in a spirit of confession, would you join together with me in our prayer of confession? Let us pray. O God, whose very name is love, we mean to do so well, but our intentions are sometimes discarded. We try to be faithful, but we are sometimes diverted by many things. We do not wish to harm anyone, but for lack of consideration, we sometimes hurt those we love the most. We sympathize for those who suffer more often than we act with them. We sometimes refuse to accept the help of others because we're unwilling to admit our needs. We too can say with the man who came to you, Lord Jesus, I'm not worthy that you should enter my house. Only say the word and I shall be healed. Please join me in our assurance of pardon. Through Christ, the dividing walls have been broken down. We have been abandoned to the world, and we can live our lives in new ways. Such a gift surely sets us free. We are free, and we will rise as God's freely chosen ones, shining the Lord in the world of love. Please take a few moments and greet each other in Christian love. Those of you who are watching, we, we give you a holy hug and pass a piece, piece of Christ on to you as well. Good morning, how are you? Chuck, how are you, buddy? Good morning, how are you this morning? Hey, my friend. Hey, how are you guys? Hi, sweetie, how are you? How are you? <laughs> Hang in there. Hello, Mark.
Please be seated. Our Old Testament is Isaiah 35, verses 1 through 3. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lemonot shall be given to it the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. I thank all of, all of you who jump in there and do what we have to do to kind of make things, um, make things work. And so my worship team, all of you, some who are on camera and some who don't want to be on camera, uh, the one that's not here today that doesn't like to be on camera, and we won't mention her name, we know who we're talking about, but all of you, we thank you. This is what makes this work. Obviously, I'm going to be sharing a number of scriptures with my sermon today, but the one that I chose will probably take prominence in the various paradoxes that Jesus talked about, Okay. And it's from John's Gospel, 10th chapter, verses 9 through 11. I am the gate. Whoever enter, enters by me will be saved and will come and go in out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. Good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. May God's blessing be added to sharing this God's word this time I always like either when we have young people to do the young people thing because we got a kick out of somebody said best children's sermon ever last week somebody had commented because of uh, us being led around and bumped into things and stuff like that so it was, it was still kind of fun I got a smile on my face today it's not going to be quite quite like that but um, I, we're, we'll, I'm going to tell you a story so all right um, how many of you discovered that uh, having things don't make you happy? Obviously, uh, you, th you, get, you think you're getting this thing, and oh, only if I get this thing, my life will be complete. Ah, uh, yeah, it's so easy to be trapped into that, especially you know if you're junkies to Amazon or something. Oh, when's this gonna arrive? When's this gonna arrive? Well, for those of you who are a little more prudent than that, I mean, it's like it's called shopping therapy, all right? You know, for those who do that. So, anyway. So, and uh, Angie, I just ordered a new rucking plate, so if I can kind of increase my weight. So, you're an inspiration. People say, you're an inspiration to me as an old guy, and he said, I don't know. You, you hear me moaning and groaning when I'm doing stuff. But I'm going to tell you a story about two kids. One little boy, we'll take a little boy, could be a little girl, doesn't matter, is, is, got, is, is very wealthy. There's nothing wrong with money. It's what we do with the money and the value and the meaning we attach to how we use that money. But this kid's got all of these toys in the world. Every time he's, you know, he'd be with his parents, oh, I want that, I want that. I mean, we get that. Obviously, sometimes we have to tell our kids no, right? So, got all these toys, and they're sitting, and they're complaining to their parents, I'm bored. Mommy, I'm bored. Daddy, I'm bored. But there's another kid with a different attitude that doesn't have all of this stuff. Now, it doesn't have to be this kid. There's this kid, uh, I was out by my friend by horse manure pile yesterday, and this young lady has brought horse manure, and my friend Jeff Smith, I get a lot of horse manure from him in my trailer, so. Um, but imagine this kid standing, you pr some of you follow social media, you probably saw that picture, a kid standing on a horse manure pile. Those piles can get pretty big, can't they? Until you do whatever you're gonna do with them. Send them to my house, probably. Um, but this kid standing on a manure pile, and he's digging furiously into this composting horse manure pile. And somebody goes, ew, especially if you're not used to the, the farm life. And he's digging through this manure pile, and, and somebody says, what are you doing? You're digging this, this worthless pile of horse manure. He says, you know, sir, this big pile here with, this, with all of this, this manure, he said, I'm digging because underneath all of this manure somewhere, there's got to be a pony there somewhere. Now, obviously, that's an exaggeration of attitude. But that's the kind of attitude that we want to set for goal. You see horsemen are piled, oh, wow. 
And you think, well, this kid's deluded. But no, it's, uh, it's all about attitude. And, and, and that leads to the good life. What really leads to the good life? So I know that's probably better. The sermon's going to be a downer from here, but, but we'll go from there. Would you join me in a moment of prayer? Oh, God, may the words which I'm about to, pr- to utter and the privilege that I now assume be acceptable in your sight. Now that we've got you uh, laughing a little bit, I uh, kind of preface this message this morning. Um, I, I walk around a lot of police and fire departments or scenes, and somebody will say, hey, how you doing, Greg? And I'll say, doing fine, thanks. I'll ask them in turn, how you doing? Living a dream. Just living a dream. Now, you all kind of know what I mean by that. I said, yeah, I have one of those kind of weeks, huh? So it's kind of the paradox. But in some ways it is. It's an honorable, noble profession. But by the same token, it's like, yeah, right, you know. Uh, but uh, but you live in, you're living a dream, living a dream, which I think is a much deeper meaning, obviously, than what it stands for. It's always interesting to discover a child's take on things, especially when it re- regards their spiritual life, their faith. The internet, not too long ago, carried a series of letters from children to their pastors. And they go like this. And they probably say what a lot of times adults would like to say. You know, kids are kind of unfiltered, like we get to the other end of life sometimes is unfiltered as well. Dear pastor, I'm sorry I can't leave more money in the plate, but my father did give me a raise in my allowance. Could you please have a sermon about a raise in my allowance? Love, Patty, age 10, New Haven. Dear Pastor, I think a lot more people would come to your church if you moved to Disneyland. (laughs) Loreen, age 9, from Tacoma. Dear Pastor, please say in your sermon that Peter Peterson has been a good boy all week. I am Peter Peterson. Sincerely, Pete age nine, Phoenix. Dear pastor, please say a prayer for our little league team. We need God's help or a new pitcher. Thank you, Alexander, age 10, Raleigh. And dear pastor, my father said I should learn the Ten Commandments. Dave would agree with that. I would agree with that. But I don't think I want to because we have enough rules around my house already. Joshua, age 10, South Pasadena. Dear Pastor, I liked your sermon on Sunday, especially when it was finished. Why are you laughing hard? (laughs) Ralph, age 11, Akron. There's a time-honored story of a Sunday school teacher who held up a portrait, a portrait of Christ. He explained to the class it was not an actual photograph of Christ, but but only an artist's conception of what Christ looks like, and often is culturally influenced as well. But, said one little girl, you got to admit it looks a lot like him. To a child, the picture of Jesus is very clear. As a wall of church on Sunday school, therefore that's what Jesus must look like. Sometimes to persons of very shallow faith, the teaching that Jesus seemed very clear as well. The the simple gospel is so easy to understand, right? We sometimes forget how much difficulty Jesus Jesus' teachings had on us his own disciples. Now, we have to admit, at times you have to be a little bit confused, so we really, it requires a deeper reflection, especially when we're dealing with translations or translations of translations. They're not ignorant men, they weren't. They were just not, they were not stupid men, and yet they were constantly asking Jesus to explain himself. When he wasn't talking in parables, it seemed like he would sometimes talk in a paradox. In order to gain your life, you have to lose it, all of that kind of stuff. I'll go through some. I want to deal with three of those most important paradoxes today. For I'm convinced that they are the keys to an abundant life, the good life. I'm the door. If anybody enters through me, he will be saved, as I had shared this morning, and will come out, I will find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come so that they may have life and have it more abundantly. The abundant life, the good life, Living the dream. One young fellow listened very intently the pastor had to say one day. And afterwards he asked his father, what was the pastor saying about ducks? Ducks. 
you never know what kids in their, their, their repertoire of lang the, the English language understand. His father said, I don't remember him saying anything about ducks, although I'd be willing to, it's duck hunting season, and I know people who like to duck hunt. The boy said, oh yes he did. He said that the life is a pair of ducks. Oh, his dad replied, you mean paradox. Oh, paradox, Dave thinks that one's funny. I think he was talking about two medical doctors, but I'm not sure what he said about them. Let me refresh your memory. A paradox is a statement, obviously, that sounds contradictory, but actually holds an abundance of truth. Now, one of the best known paradoxes, we'll go through some of them, is from today's lesson in Mark. Jesus called that crowd, obviously, we, we've used that text before, along with the disciples and said, if anybody would come after me, they must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For he or she who saves themselves will lose it, but whoever loses their life, for me and the gospel will save it. Huh. Sounds contradictory. Now, but but it, I, I think there's a deeper meaning here. Yet these are some of the truest words ever spoken. We'll get to that. Albert Einstein once said that the closer you get to the truth, the more it appears to be a paradox. I don't know what paradox Einstein had in, in mind could not be greater than this one. Whoever loses his life for me for the sake of the gospel will save it. There are these three paradoxes that permeate our teachings that, that I'm lifting up. First is this, anything you save will be lost. Years ago, Bishop Reuben Job told about an experience in his own family. He said, one day a couple of years ago, I picked up one of my sons who was 14 years old and competing in a track meet. As any busy father, I wasn't there, but probably should have been there when he ran the race. But I went to pick him up, and I was eager to see how he did. As he came out of the gate, I could see that he had not won. You could tell the difference between when you win and when you lose. That morning, he had left and said, Daddy, I feel great. I had a good night's sleep, I'm training, and I feel like I really will do well today. He doesn't normally do well in track meets. I think he won two races in 10 years, and that day he came to the car. I could see that he had not won the race, he had not gone well. I thought we could get it over with and said, son, how did you do? And he replied, the worst I've ever done. I said, what went wrong? You thought you would do better. He said, well, you see, dad, daddy, it's like this. I run the 330. I don't know too many people run the 330 anymore, but uh, in junior high school where we go, we train on a 330-yard track. I remember uh, we had a cinder track where I was growing up and it was junior high, it wasn't middle school. And, um, and it, I think it was, a, it, was a, it was a quarter mile track. Um, but they staked out 440 yards and I misjudged the race. I started off easy, saving myself, and I started running really hard late. The race was over too quickly. And when the race was over, I had too much left over. I hadn't used all that I had. Huh. My friends, there is a, this is a parable, the tragedy of our lives. When it's all said and done, it's not what we have received too little, but that we've not used what God has personally given each of us. Somebody once said, I think it was Zig Ziglar, the motivational speaker, the late Zig Ziglar, once said that, um, and I'm putting a lozenge in my throat here because I, with this ulcer in my throat, I get sometimes a little scratchy, so excuse that. I do that, I tuck it into a corner somewhere. But Zig Ziglar once said that, um, you know where the richest place in the world is? It's a cemetery. He said that's where people go not having risk to make the most of their lives and use their lives the way God has intended. They go to the grave with that. You've heard me say something about that in the past. Many will get to the end of life and realize I didn't use all that I had. The servant took one talent and buried it in the ground. The other two servants put their, their talents to work 
anything you save in this world will be lost. We, we, we have so much that we could give away, our love, our friendship, our time. Anything we save will be lost. That's true of all aspects of life. Medical doctor F. Baran Wolf once wrote, if you observe a really happy person, you'll find him or her doing something meaningful. Now, not obviously, not everybody has the skills or even the physical well-being to do the, his suggestions here, so I wanted to preface that. He said, the happiest people are those who by, find sometimes building a boat, writing a symphony, educating their children or grandchildren, growing double dahlias in their garden, or looking for dinosaur eggs in the Gobi Desert. To find happiness, we must look, must seek for it in a focus outside of ourselves. Obviously, we also have to take care of ourselves within, too. I would add, we need to find a purpose, a meaningful mission beyond ourselves. I find that with every crisis I respond to, I'm always looking for the after effect, what happens. So a person has a purpose for living is a person who is giving him or herself who is happiest. Anything you save will lose. Now this brings me to the second paradox. It's related to the first. Anything that you share, you will regain. Think about love. You ever give too much love away? You, you, by giving the, the love that God gives each of us away, does that diminish the love? No. If when we light the candles later in the year, we light a candle and we have the candlelight vigil, you know, like a service at, at Christmas Eve, does the candle get dimmer, the one that started the original flame? No. It just, it just shares more. And I think that's a, such a wonderful thing. It sometimes gets lost. The paradox of love is that the more that you use up to help others, the more you get in return. The good life, that is the good life. We're created for sharing. Would you like to spend a miserable day? Don't share it with anyone. Now, there are times we just want to close the doors. I get that. We're created for sharing. Now, we all need time alone. I get that. But wouldn't it be sad to have a beautiful painting, have a beautiful painting hang in your house? Say it was a Rembrandt or a Picasso, and never be able to show it to anybody else? How absurd to read about someone who is an expensive painting and puts it in a vault and never brings it out. Now, I, I can understand that if it's worth 20 or 30 million bucks, like that Gutenberg Bible story I was telling you about, Dave, earlier. A work of art needs to be shared. We'd want to say to our neighbors, come see what I have. Of course, then you might think, well, gee whiz, you know, expose too many people to what I've got. I know where, where our thinking goes. Then somebody's going to blab and somebody who's not so scrupulous is going to break into our house and try to steal it. Anything we share, we regain. When we share and work together, we are strong. And together, this is a part of the good life. We certainly ought to know that. We know that here in this church. We really do. The story, great story, about a giant bridge that was being built across a portion of New York's harbor. Years ago, engineers were searching for a place where they could rest the mighty buttresses for the bridge. But they discovered a daunting obstacle on their way. Deep in the mud, in the slimy mud layer, lay an old, sunken, huge barge that was full of bricks and stones. Huh. That was an impediment. It had to be moved. Yet in spite of every device used, it remained firmly entrenched, embedded in that mud. If you ever had your foot stuck in the mud, you know, and it comes up with suction and creates a vacuum, can you imagine a huge barge full of rocks and bricks? At last, one of the engineers conceived a very bright idea. He gathered other barges around the sunken barge and chained them to the sunken vessel with very strong chains when the tide was low. Then everybody waited. The tide was coming in. Higher and higher rose that water. And when it did, 
all those barges on the surface rose with it, including the old boat that was mired to the bottom of the harbor. There's a children's book about a couple in Sussex, England, where, who, was, who were buying a new teacup. The wife said to her husband, look at this one, it's so beautiful, I want you to buy it. And because this is a fantasy story, the teacup spoke and said, but, uh, but you didn't, but you, you know I wasn't always beautiful. Now in the children's story, the teacup can talk and the couple isn't surprised. So they simply asked the teacup what it meant. The teacup said, originally it was this soggy, ugly, damp lump of clay. They put me on a wheel and he started turning that wheel until my head became dizzy. Then he started to poke and prod, and ouch, that hurt. I cried out, stop. They said, not yet. At long last, they did stop the wheel and put me in a furnace. It became hotter and hotter and hotter till I could not stand it any longer. And I cried out, stop, but they said, not yet. Finally, they took me out of the furnace and somebody started to put paint on me and the fumes from the paint made me ill. It made my head swim and I cried out, stop. But they said, not yet. And when long last they'd finished the painting, they put me back in the furnace and it was hotter than it was before. And I cried out, stop, and he said, not yet. Finally, they took me out of the furnace. And after I had cooled down, they placed me on a tabletop in front of a mirror. I remember myself as this soggy, ugly, damp lump of clay. When I looked at my image in the mirror, I lost my breath and I said in amazement, I and beautiful. And then I knew it was only the pain through what I went through that it made it possible for me to be beautiful. I talk about the, po the concept of post-traumatic growth. You've heard me talk about it. The Japanese concept of kentsugi. It will take a broken vessel, put it together with gold amalgam, which further emphasizes the scars. This is not unlike that story. We all have scars. We all were that lump of clay, and we all have dealt with and will deal with painful stuff in our lives. But God can use that. I don't wish that for any of us, but it happens. And it's how and what God forges in that furnace that makes all the difference in the world, those who have faith. God can take the ugliness and the drabness of our lives and turn those lives into something beautiful, an abundant life, a good life, we are the clay, he is the potter. We stand looking at a century old oak tree and we wonder how this marvelous thing, this miracle, ever rose its head out of the dead earth. As a matter of fact, it did not, not with the help of the earth alone. A tree is transformed by sunlight. It drew most of its nutrients from the earth, to be sure, the minerals and water and stuff, but the tree is forever drawing upon that stream of sunlight which flood it, which give it life. It's this intangible light energy is absorbed into the leaf and blossom and fiber until this tree grows into a mighty majestic oak giving shade to all. My friends, God is a God of cre is a creator of beauty. God can take our lives and make something beautiful out of them if we are willing to have faith in God. This is what leads to a truly abundant life, the good life. Would you join me in a moment of prayer? Gracious and loving God, we thank you that you are the potter and we are the clay. We thank you, God, for these stories of paradoxes, which sometimes confuse us. But I think, God, if we really, really ponder what Jesus did, his disciples did, what early Christians did, then we understand the wisdom 
and the brilliance of those words. Amen. This time I'd like to ask what prayers of joy or concern would you like to lift up? I've got a long list here. Um, and I, I, I'd rather hear from some of you first, though. I may reiterate. Marge? Thank you. Thank you, March. Other prayers this morning? I will share mine. Donna Klum was in the hospital, some of you know. He's home now. Uh, so, Donna, if you're, my guess is, she, I don't know if she's listening or watching, but Christ in your mercy. And Ron Mull, uh, as some of you already know, uh, Ron, I know you and Barb are watching. Um, we, we pray you don't get any sicker, but he tested positive, and he, he, he's got a cold congestion, so hopefully that's as bad as it gets. Uh, so prayers for him. Also for Jim Klug, obviously, his cancer. Uh, J.R. Manning. Uh, some of you know J.R. Some of you follow social media. I was over there the other day. They've got him in home hospice care. And uh, he, uh, he said, there are only two people I want to see besides my wife. One of them was me, and I'm privileged. I said, we'll help you through this, JR, you and Kathy. So uh, great guy, got a, a real sense of uh, punishing. He liked a pun. He's a punster. So JR and Kathy, if you're watching, you're in our prayers as well. Prayers for Haiti. Haiti is just getting hammered all over again. 2010, 300,000 people were killed by an earthquake. This one here uh, was like two-tenths stronger, whatever that means in the, on that scale. But um, So uh, already it's been a country that's been struggling in so many ways, you know, some political and some just bad things happening. So. Uh, so Christ in your mercy would you join me in prayer gracious and loving God you've heard the prayers of our heart those things that we have shared those who have been diagnosed with cancer who may need treatment will certainly need guidance as to what steps to take and decisions to make for those who are in periods of transition, gracious God, we pray for peace and strength and that eternal hope and your light, which is with us at all times and all places, wherever we go. For those, gracious God, in Haiti, people are suffering. They need the world's help. They've always needed the world's help. We pray, gracious God, persistently that at some point in that history that that Caribbean nation can return to what it was many, 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 many years ago, which was a place of beauty and lacked corruption. We pray for those people, God, for those who are suffering with COVID, for those who are struggling in healthcare settings. The public health nurses that people don't seem to be so happy with these days who are leaving in droves, who are crying out for help. We pray, gracious God, for strength and patience for us as a public to be with them. Be with us, God, as we make decisions, as we continue to be your church. And now, gracious God, we together, heart to heart, pray and lift up the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples by praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts 
as we forgive our debtors. It's not unto temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Freely and richly has God blessed us. And we have been faithful stewards. Um, so I don't have to do any sermons about um, raising Timmy's allowance or whatever the case may be. But uh, no, and it, so I'm proud of all of you and all of us and the efforts we've made. But, but uh, at this time, we will share in the celebration of our sharing, our generosity, and giving to God his glory in our morning offering after Mark plays. Gracious and always loving God, we would ask you to accept these gifts which we, your people, offer up to you. Grant that the causes to which they are devoted be causes of love given to your glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray, we share, and we live. Amen.
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. strong and true. No, he will guide you in all you do. Go now in faith and show you believe. Reach out to others so all the world can see. Watching from above, go now in peace, in faith.